Welcome to Worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church in Peoria. I'm the Reverend Jennifer Innes. It is my joy to be the minister of this congregation, along with fellow humans of all ages and at all stages of life. This is an intentional community. We are committed to embracing a free and responsible search for truth and meaning, to loving inclusively, to growing in mind, body, and spirit, and to doing our part to help heal the world. It is good to be together. Welcome to worship. Part of our practice is to recognize our history and how we are connected. These lands were the home of the Peoria people. They created their own communities and lives here long before we arrived. This congregation supports itself largely on the gifts of time, talent, and money of its members and friends. Regular financial donations sustain the congregation in all the ways that we gather online or in person. The link to make a donation is in the chat, and the link will be in the slide at the end of the service. Thank you for your generous gifts. And if you are a guest or a visitor, thank you for joining us today. Uh, please help us get to know you. If you are local to Peoria, you are welcome to join us after worship for coffee hour. We will be outside on the patio. Also, you're welcome to contact us through the website for more information. And I have one very special announcement. As of August 22nd, we will be moving to creating worship live and in person from the sanctuary. The fully recorded services have been essential as we have been getting through the pandemic together. And we realize how much it means to share live worship as well. Your worship options will include one, to be masked and in the sanctuary, two, to watch on Zoom, or a third option will be to catch a recording of the service at another time. Children ages three to 11 will be supervised in play outside after starting in the sanctuary. This is a big change. I mean, this is a big change. The next few Sundays will be a chance to learn how to do worship in this new way together. Um, we are trying to kind of learn a little bit, tweak a little bit before we have our in-gathering on September 12th. Thank you very much for your patience and your support and for your encouragement as we navigate all of these paths together. Please let us know of any questions and look for additional announcements by email. And now let us enter into worship together. From Reverend Daniel Cantor, Senior Minister at First Unitarian Church in Dallas. To love life. To love life is to notice the wonders that abound. And to notice the wonders that abound is to be grounded here and now. And to be grounded here and now is the beginning of finding love for this life today. Let us ground ourselves in this instant, in the worship of all things good and right. 
Our Chalice Lighting words come from Reverend Dr. Hope Johnson's One Love in the anthology, Voices from the Margins. Reverend Hope was a beloved elder in Unitarian Universalism who passed away last November in the words of her East Coast colleagues. Her expansive areas of expertise and service defy description. Hope was the go-to person for conflict transformation. She was embedded in racial justice efforts and she spent untold hours with congregants, religious professionals, leaders of color, and Central East Region staff supporting our work and helping unravel church, slight, church life's stickiest situations. Reverend Hope described herself as a dreamer who gives life to her dreams by taking action. For our chalice lighting, we are one. Working, eating, laughing, playing, singing, storytelling, sharing, and rejoicing. Getting to know each other, taking risks, opening up, questioning, seeking, searching, trying to understand, struggling, making mistakes. As many of you know, my background in ministry includes religious education. And I'd like to tell you about an aspect of that ministry that I've been doing uh, and learning about since 2004. This part of ministry is a method for Unitarian Universalist religious education called spirit play. In spirit play, we use stories, ritual, art, and imagination. We typically gather in a circle of children um, and we answer big questions such as, why am I here? What is my place in the universe? How shall I live? How we die? And everything in between. Spirit play really is an experience. And I'm going to do the best I can to provide some of that experience in worship across all the ways that we gather now. I invite you to be part of this experiment and this experience. So I'm about to tell you a story told in the spirit play style. Um, and let me give the scene. So imagine that we are in a room where everyone, people of all ages, in fact, can reach the paper and the markers and the paint and felt and scissors. The stories are there too in interesting boxes and baskets. We begin for spirit play at the threshold of the room, at the door. And there is a person at the door who is prepared to welcome us and ask us if we are ready to enter the circle. The storyteller uh, is there in the room, anchoring the circle, and is ready to welcome us there, perhaps in, the, in a chair or on the floor. Now, when the circle is gathered, the storyteller greets us all invites us to sing together, perhaps, and to further be ready for the story. The storytelling in this case is somewhat different than the dynamic theater that often is the case in worship. This storytelling is intentional, uh, with the storyteller focused on the story itself as modeling that person's own spiritual practice. And when the story is complete, there are a few questions for wondering. In this case, I will invite you to ponder these questions on your own. Now, let us read, get ready to enter the story, and we will be in the story of Francis David by the Reverend Ralph Roberts. The story tip for today is from our Unitarian history in Transylvania. The story is about the church leader, Francis David. Now watch as I prepare for the story. I wonder, I wonder what this could be. It is very green 
and large can take up much of the table. This looks like grass, perhaps a lot of grass and land. I wonder, see, this could be columns, could be a bridge. Let's see what else we have. Ah. Turrets. And more. And more pieces. And more. And still more. These look like walls. Ah, now we are ready to begin. These are the walls of a great city, an important city. It was an important city because it is where the king lived, King John Sigismund. Now, the king the king would say, who could come and go into the city? The king also said, what crops could be planted around the city? This was an exciting time. People had many conversations and many different opinions about the nature of the mystery some people call God. There were many churches. And the people, well, people felt so strongly about what their church believed or what they believed that they would get into great debates, great arguments but they also would fight and sometimes hurt each other. Now, King Sigismund knew that the fighting couldn't continue and he, he wanted to have peace in the kingdom. But he listened to his mother, Queen Isabella, who counseled him to be thoughtful and kind King Sigismund also knew he couldn't make this decision all by himself. So he asked the leaders of some of the churches. He asked the leader of the first church how he thought the kingdom should look. And the leader of the first church thought the kingdom should look like this. The king thanked the first leader and thought about that. The king asked the leader of the second church how he thought the kingdom should look. The leader of the second church thought the kingdom should look like this.
The king thanked the leader of the second church and thought about all he said. The king asked the leader of the third church. This was the Unitarian church, and the leader of that church was Francis David. King Sigismund asked Francis David how he thought the kingdom should look. And Francis David said, the kingdom should look like this. And this. And this. And this. Francis David said to King Sigismund, this is how the kingdom should look if you would like to have peace. I wonder, I wonder where you are in the story. I wonder what the church leaders from the first two churches thought about Francis David's idea. I wonder what the people from the fifth church, what they thought. They were not even asked. I wonder what inspired King Sigismund to choose this direction of the church. And not only did Sigismund choose this vision of the church, Sigismund also chose the Unitarian church as his own church. I wonder where you are in the story. I wonder what we could leave out and still have all the story we need. Now watch as I put the story away. Francis David and the king and all of the walls. and the ground itself. Thank you for joining me for the story.
from the Reverend Sarah Lawal. Spirit of life and love, in the silence, in the stillness, we hear the call of our own heart, its tender dreams, its sorrows and its triumphs. In the silence, in the stillness, we hear whispers of days gone by, of dreams still becoming the promise of the future. We celebrate together our individual journeys and dreams and our collective ones, knowing the journey is so much richer with others to share in it. In the name of all that is holy, we pray and we gather. In every worship, we share the joys and the sorrows, the names and the milestones that are among us and that have been asked to be shared in this time and space. There are moments when we simply gather in recognition that there is so much in our lives and in our hearts and so much remains unspoken. After the service, I encourage you to turn to the people in your life and ask, how is it with your heart? Or what is the state of your soul? Perhaps you can do so in person or on the phone, by email, on video, texting, all the ways that we can connect. Greet each other and listen well. Our lives are so precious. Let us aid each other in being good stewards of these gifts. In our larger world, we offer our sympathies and our prayers to the people of Haiti. They are recovering from a devastating earthquake that hit on Saturday. The numbers of the dead and the wounded will rise. We extend our hearts and our hopes to them that more people will be rescued and the leaders will be wise as they proceed. Let us hold one more moment together in quiet attention for all the celebrations, the struggles, the losses, the doubts, and the wonderings. In this common space and time, the community is with us in all the ways that we gather. Our joys are amplified when they are known, and our sorrows and our burdens are lightened when they are shared. Let us hold one more moment in quiet and breathe. Amen. From Spirit Play by Dr. Nita Penfold. The religious impulse can be defined as that spiritual awe we feel when we are confronted with the cosmic, the universal, the basic mystery inherent at the core of living. It is deeply connected to our own experiences of something beyond ourselves, whether that be the immensity of the universe, or some concept of an energy that moves through all things, or the spirit of life and mystery that some people have named God. We can find it in our child's first smile, or the death of a loved one, or the breathtaking aspects of nature. Whenever we find it, the religious impulse is grounded in our personal experience. How we as human beings respond to the mystery inherent in the universe and our own experiences have taken many forms throughout history. Prayer, religion, and ritual as the primary emotional responses. Science, mathematics, and technology as the primarily intellectual response. Patterns that connect. And the arts of story, dance, music, and visual arts, and poetry as primarily creative responses. These responses have shaped the basis for all culture and religion. In Spirit Play, we talk about the spirit of love and mystery that some people call God. Children can relate to the language of love, and by connecting it to the theological language, they will understand what it is that children from other faiths are talking about when the conversation turns 
as it inevitably will, to what they believe about God. It gives them language to talk about their own experiences of the ultimate in whatever form has meaning for them. Hey, everybody, come sing a song with me. Here's our note. La. Come, come sing a song with me. Come sing a song with me. Come sing a song with me that I might know your mind. And I'll bring you home when hope is hard to find. And I'll bring a song of love and a rose in the winter time. Come dream a dream with me. Come. spirit play to congregations, I never expected that I would spend a year with Ghostbusters. Yes, Ghostbusters, that movie from 1984, set in New York City with a bunch of bumbling guys running around in proton packs and lasers trying to capture ghosts and, well, save the world. For a whole year, no matter what story I told in Unitary Universalist theology or history or world religions or global conservation, uh, Ghostbusters showed up every week in the kindergarten and grade one spirit play class. There were the character names, uh, their coveralls, uh, so were some of the ghosts. Um, the art would include highly detailed illustrations of the proton packs, the uh, unlicensed nuclear accelerators that powered the ghost busting. And that was okay. And this is why. After I would tell a story, uh, such as Francis David, the circle of children would have time to explore through art or creative play. Each child was free to choose from anything in the room. Uh, there were craft supplies, there were other stories, they could set up the chalice, they could build sacred spaces with blocks whatever was prepared. They didn't have to respond to the story. This was their time for work. They could do everything. Um, they weren't expected to repeat the story or reproduce the information they had heard. Um, this time was theirs. They could do yoga or paint or read or dress up. The adults were there for questions and to be curious and companions with them without setting up the children to think that the adults were looking for the right answers. So, but how did Ghostbusters come to Sunday school? Well, 
let me give a little bit of history that leads up to spirit play. Um, we start actually quite some time ago in Italy in the early 1900s. Dr. Maria Montessori, uh, she worked with some of the poorest children in the area. At the time, children also were seen as vessels to be filled and society had low expectations of children in poverty. Now, Dr. Montessori, she treated the children with respect. She experimented with how to encourage their learning and their interest. Um, she tried different structures, different materials. She found that children worked well with well-made materials that inspired curiosity and play, that the children worked well when they had child-sized equipment and desks, when they had an environment that included nature and science and enough quiet to let them sustain deep concentration. In fact, Dr. Montessori found that in a well-prepared space, the children were guiding and teaching themselves. The adults in the rooms were companions and helped, uh, but were not about wondering whether a child was getting a specific amount of information or being were on a single path. Now, Catholic educators took up this approach for their own Sunday programs. In the 1960s, educators created the Catechism of the Good Shepherd, and they created an atrium where children could learn uh, scripture and listen for God. They used the same pedagogy about providing uh, an attractive space and interesting materials. Now, fast forward to the 1970s, and there was an Episcopalian priest, Jerome Berryman. He learned about the Catholic program and thought it had potential for Protestant education. He created Godly Play. Now, in Godly Play, uh, the purpose of the program is to give children an embodied experience of the liturgical year and what worship means the story uh, is equivalent to the scripture in worship. Uh, the work time would be equivalent to the sermon. And class would end with a form of communion called the feast. Now, the feast didn't have to have food, per se. Uh, the company and shared time together, that nurtured uh, connection. And that was in itself a form of feast. Now, in the 1990s, Unitarian Universalist educators wanted something that would be engaging and not simply rely on uh, more crafts in class. And Dr. Nita Penfold, Beverly Loop Bruce, and Reverend Ralph Roberts, uh, they took the godly play training and adapted it for Unitarian Universalism. And spirit play began to be in congregations in 2000. Now, I heard about spirit play uh, when I needed a way to create a richer program that had more spiritual depth and would provide more options for children who, well, they weren't going to be satisfied by paper and glue and paint and so on. So in 2004, I brought Spirit Play to my ministry in Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, and in 2018, Dr. Penfold retired and I had the fortune to become the director. Now, along the way of all of this history of Montessori and the Catholic education and the Protestant education and Unitarian Universalism, there was space for Ghostbusters. Now, the structure of a spirit playroom remains the same as with godly play, with children being welcomed into the room, uh, joining the circle with the storyteller, hearing the story, wondering a bit together in the circle, then the, choosing, the children choose work and they close the, school, close the session with a feast. And that time for choosing work is open for what a child would like to pursue. Now, as an educator and a minister, I know that every one of us has great questions about life and death and our place in the flow of everything. These questions begin early at our very earliest stages with how we define self and understand that there is an other, get to know the world and learn about emotions and needs. These questions are unspoken at first, 
but they certainly are there. And children get to hear in the spirit play classes, they get to hear stories about unitary universalist principles and sources, um, about science and nature, about caring for the earth. There are cosmic stories about the universe, small stories about the weight of a snowflake. And in the case of one child, for some reason, they needed to work with Ghostbusters for an entire program year. The other teachers showed attention and respect for this work. Um, however it might have shown up on a given day, whether it was on a letter-sized piece of paper or on some great roll of parchment. For me, play is creating a place of trust and love. And as an adult, in such places, uh, as part of creating such places, but also as part of simply being present to others in a place of such play, I get to learn as much as I guide. Religious education in any form is one of mutuality. And one of our great purposes in creating beloved communities in a liberal approach to religion is the liberation of mind and heart and body. And we can accomplish that goal, that spirit of freedom, when we are based in an environment that is of, that includes trust and support and mutual discovery. When a space is prepared and a child can trust, more questions show up, other questions. There was another moment when a child was dealing with the death of a parent from addiction. And on a particular Sunday, and I was telling an entirely unrelated story to a few of the children during the work time, this child, in their language, um, suddenly asked about the power of addiction and why their parent died. They did not know what to make of the ways that the adults described and what happened and why this beloved person was so wonderful, and they were, and so ill all at the same time. This is one of those moments when um, the spiritual practice of being in the room was very helpful because this is one of those moments when the internal uh, conversation in the in a teacher's head or my head was wow what are we going to do with this question and wow how sad and how heartbreaking to be in this position for this child and there we were with this child asking and other children present and listening as well of course i couldn't give many definitive answers in that moment but what I could do was recognize that sometimes there are big struggles in our lives and assure this child that they are loved, they are supported, and that their parent loved them very much. And sometimes those struggles are so big and so hard, but that the best we can do is still remain together and wonder and care for each other. The work and the questions that come up in spirit play, well, it reminds me of one of my favorite phrases, that we have all the time we need. This spaciousness of time is so counter to the impulse, the drive for production and efficiency and work product that typifies a lot of our society. But simply to say what can be a radical thing of, we have all the time we need. It models that spaciousness. It gives that permission for a child to engage in any question they have. And for us to do the best we can 
withholding and respecting the power and the complexity of every question that is before us and within us. When such a space is prepared, we nurture the stewardship of self, of life. We get to focus on process, on the path that we want to create, on the promises we make to each other, and live out our shared theological language, our values. We get to practice inclusion, a radical welcome for everyone who is in the space. We get to model being a place of trust and let that spirit in each of us shine. We have very little time with our children in an education program, even in the most robust class schedule in a given year. But when we can do well by them and create deep play, provide such wonderful freedom of exploration, that provides such a, a net, a foundation of strength for them so they can create and they can trust. And that in turn becomes a gift to themselves, to us, to our faith, and to the world. For me, spirit play is a microcosm of what we want to create together as a beloved community. Whether or not one uses a particular curriculum, I will say, whatever the curriculum might be, in any context, in any community, it is for us to ask, what is the space we are creating for these lives, for our lives? And I will offer the wondering, I wonder what is my answer, and I wonder what is yours. What happens in our response matters greatly. It makes a difference for all of us. So let us go forth in our wondering together and say and ask, what places of trust shall we create together? Amen. Our closing hymn is written by one of our Unitarian Universalist elders, the late Reverend Thomas Michelson. Let us turn to the hymn, Wake Now My Senses. Wake now my senses and hear the earth call. Feel the deep power of being. Keep with the web of creation your vow, giving, receiving as love shows us how. Wake now, my reason, reach out to the new, join with each pilgrim whose quest for the true. Honor the beauty and wisdom of time. Suffer thy image and praise the sublime. Quick now, compassion, give heed to the cry. Voices of suffering fill the white sky. Take as your neighbor both stranger.
We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. And now, may the blessings of love be upon us. May the spirit of joy find a home in our heart. Let us bring the gift of play and the space and grace to explore the big questions in the company of compassionate friends. Let us bring this gift into a bruised and hurting world. Our worship is ended. Let our service begin. <laughs>